Okay. This meeting is being <coughs> recorded. Okay, can everybody see the screen? Yeah. Okay, great. So this talk is going to be for going over a simplicial and singular homology, which is chapter 2.1 in Hatcher. Just let me know if you can't hear me suddenly because we don't have the best Wi-Fi. Um, but so I'll just start by introducing it. Um, the this homology, in some sense, it basically counts the n-dimensional holes in a space. So if you think about that for intuition, it might help with some of the problems. Um, first, I'll go over what simplicial homology is, which isn't so general, but it can be a nice way to think about some problems for simple spaces. And then I'll talk about singular homology, which is a little bit more important. So the first definition is a n simplex. A one simplex is just interval. A two simplex is a triangle. A three simplex is like this little pyramid. And then in n dimensions, you can generalize it to be this, I guess, n dimensional tetrahedron or something like that. Um, it's just all the points in Rn plus one, such that um, the coordinates are less than or equal to one and there's some as one. Um, so it's the vertex ordering is actually gonna be important for label for later. So it does matter what like how you label the vertices somewhat. And simplicial homology is all about putting delta complexes onto a space and then using those to define homology groups. Um, you can think of it similar to a CW complex, but instead of gluing together disks by their boundaries, you're constructing the space by gluing together and simple simplices. Um, and then, so here are some examples of how you could put a delta complex structure in a space. For example, here's the torus. This is kind of the usual picture where you've <coughs> taken um, the real numbers and then identified the integers. So you're just identifying the opposite ends of this square and all the vertices collapse together. Um, but you can draw this using two triangles, which are one or two simplices. This is the projective space. You can see that the orientations going in the opposite directions because you're kind of identifying points on opposite ends of a line through this. And then S1 is just going to be a one simplex where you identify the endpoints. Um, again, in these pictures, just note that arrows indicate the orientation. So it's pointing from a low vertex index to a high one, and that'll be important a little bit later. So formally, um, the delta complex is a collection of maps um, from n simplices into your space x. These maps um, need to pretty much embed the n simplices into your space. So they're injective on the interiors. And um, you, for create the restriction to a face of the simplex, that's it should be another map in your collection on it n minus one simplex um this is just the formal rules for putting the complex structure on a space and i guess the important thing to remember is you're just taking n simplices and gluing them together by their boundaries to approximate what the space looks like but in this case it it's injective on the interior so it's a pretty restrictive criteria. So now we get to how you can define these homology groups. So first, um, this delta n, this is going to be this group of n chains. So we're taking a free abelian group over Z whose basis is the n simplices. And you could notice we're just writing them, you're, we're just writing them 
based on your characteristic map. So it's actually referring to the image of this map, but we just read it as sigma. Um, and so elements of these are just, elements of this group is just formal sums in these n simplices with coefficients in Z. So there's, it's abelian, but there's no relations between these and the simplices. Um, and then we need, in order to define the homology groups, we need a way to move from an n chain group n chains to a group of n minus one chains. So we define a boundary homomorphism. Um, sorry, this is my first time using this tab. So. The boundary homomorphism from the group of n chains to n minus one chains is delta n. And to put it really simply, it's an alternating sum around the boundary of your n simplex. So I'm just going to go back to this picture and we can calculate this for a couple of these. So if you look at this torus example, you look at this um, two simplex u, the boundary homomorphism, you walk around the edges of it and then um, sum them according to orientation. So this would be A plus B minus C would be the boundary of U. The boundary of L should be C minus A minus B because we're going against the arrows in A and B. Um, and then formally, we can define this on each of our n simple Cs. It's just the alternating sum over that maps restriction to a n minus one size subset of the vertices. And this little hat, I think this notation means we leave out V1 or VI. Um, does this map make sense? Does anybody have any questions about the what the boundary map is doing before I continue? The the note you were making before about like the face map or something, is that involved here or uh... oh um yeah it's so yeah so in this collection um, basically, you'll have a map for every n simplex. It's so, in, for example, in here, um, you'll have some a characteristic map for this two simplex u, and then in your set of maps, you'll out also have one for the one simplex c, the one simplex b, and the one simplex a. So, in your um, I guess like in the one group of one chains, you will have an element A plus B minus C, because that's a sum of coefficients in Z of the one simplices. And that element is actually the boundary U under the boundary homomorphism. So you can see it super visually here. Yeah, so the, the, the face here would be C, but the boundary of U would be that A plus B minus C. So does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, and then there's just this very um, kind of simple proof that I'll go over that when you compose these maps, the N boundary homomorphism, from n to n minus one with the one from n plus one to n. So we have basically, we have one going from the group of n chains, n plus one chains to the group of n chains to the group of n minus one chains. There's delta n, there's delta n plus one. So we're just proving that the composition of these two maps is zero, which is gonna allow us to define a homology group um, on these uh, groups of n chains because they form a chain complex. So the proof of this is pretty simple. It's just 
using this alternating sum formula. So let's say, and it, it suffices to show it for a, one of the basis elements. So let's just calculate this for sum um, n plus one simplex, sigma alpha. So that's gonna be the boundary, so del n, the sum over the i's of this map restricted to all the indices except for the, all the vertices except for the i. Um, and then when we take the boundary homomorphism again, we need to take an alternating sum over these um, n simplices, but removing another vertex j. So what we're gonna get is that this is the sum of all the j's that are less than i. Um, and the sum over i. where we remove the vertices Vj and Vi. And then we need to add the sum over all these Js that are greater than I. But in this case, um, we're gonna actually have a minus one to the J minus one because we have removed an additional vertex. And then we'll write that all out. Now, if we just swap the i and j in this term, what we get is basically the sum of this guy plus the sum over all j less than i, the sum over i of a minus one to the j minus one to the i minus one, of all this stuff, which is just the negative of this first term. So we got zero. Um, and this is it's really simple to prove, but it's important because it's what shows that this is a chain complex and allows us to define the homology groups. And we defined the nth simplicial homology group put this delta here as the kernel of delta n mod the image of delta n plus one. So just note that the last quarter when we talked about the cohomology groups, we had all the arrows pointing to the left and we were going from a low degree thing to um, a high degree thing. But in this case, we have all the arrows pointing to the right we're going from something of higher degree to something lower degree because we're taking a boundary. And that's gonna be the case like for anything that we do in the rest of the talk, all the compositions are gonna be um, res respected in these homology groups. I think you'll see what I mean better when I talk about um, induced maps a little later, but it's just everything is going the other direction of the cohomology. And then um, one way to think about the homology group is that it's classes of cycles mod boundaries of n plus one simplices. So, for example, if we go back to this torus, um, a cycle or maybe this, this circle is a super simple example. So a cycle <clears throat> on the zero simplices would just be something that gets sent to zero under the boundary homomorphisms. I mean, it's really just anything for the zeros, but then the, um, the boundary, well, I guess, okay, S1's really a terrible example. Um, but I mean, you could imagine that maybe in these I can't really find one, but if you had arrows that were all 
pointing around a circle in the same direction, that would be in the kernel of the uh, boundary map. And so that would be a cycle basically. And then the boundaries is just anything that's a boundary of a one dimension higher than simplex. So, um, I guess for this, it would be pretty good to do a couple of examples. So I'm gonna just calculate the homology groups for a couple of these. So first I'll do S1. So this, the group of, sorry. So the group of zero chains of S1 is just gonna be isomorphic to Z because it's just generated by this single vertex V. And the group of one chains in S1, it's um, also gonna be isomorphic to Z because it's just generated by this single cycle E. So then we can try to figure out, first of all, what is the zero homology group? So if we look at the kernel of this map, that's just always everything. So it's everything generated by this vertex V. And then if we want to look at the image of the boundary map, or sorry, Well, the only one simplex that we have here is E. So if we calculate the boundary map on this, let's just think of it as having these vertices V0 and V1. So if we calculate del E, what we get is positive sign V1, V0 minus V1, but we've identified V0 and V1 so that shows that the boundary on E is just zero. So now we have that the zero homology group of S1 is just gonna be Z mod zero. So it's just gonna be Z. Uh, is, it, then, is it V not minus V1 or V1 minus V not? Um, because it'll I be like negative one to the be, zero and then we remove uh, this. Because the sign goes with the one you eliminate, right? So yeah. it's it's going to be V1 minus V0. Sorry about that. Um, so, and then, I mean, if we wanted to calculate H1 of S1, so the things in the kernel are exactly E, because we've shown that it's zero under the boundary. And then there's nothing in the image because we don't have any two simplexes in our um, definition of S1. So this is also just gonna be isomorphic to Z. Does that example make sense, everyone? Hopefully. Okay, and I'll just really quickly go through this calculation for the torus. So, <clears throat> this group is just again generated by the single vertex V. Um, this group of one chains is going to be generated by. Um, a, B, and C, and the two chains are just generated by this L and O. So um, when we calculate the boundary for the one simplices, we should get just 
zero again because every single one of these has its two endpoints identified. So it's going to be the same scenario as in the S1 case. So if we calculate the, the kernel, or the, sorry, the image of del1, that's just zero, because so it's the same case as for S1. So this shows that H0 of the torus is Z. And now if we want to calculate what's the image of del2. Well, so if we go around, we calculate the boundary on L, that's going to be B plus A minus C. If we calculate the boundary on O, this is going to be C minus B minus A. Um, and then you can see that these two, when we add them together, it gives zero. So um, is basically we have two generators. So with this group is isomorphic to. Oh my gosh! So the image. Um, So, so what can we say about the dimension? Basically, the this shows us that the kernel. Yeah, what is the kernel of del two? Del two is zero. There is just generated by one element, the the L plus O. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the kernel is Z, so then we get the, the second homology group for the torus, it's also Z. Um, but then for the first one, it's going to be the, the kernel of del 1 mod the image of del2. So the kernel like is basically just going to be everything. So that's z3, z3 copies of z, but then the image of del2 is going to be one copy of z. So we get that h1 is z plus z. And then super quickly for the sphere, we can think of this as gluing together two, um, <clears throat> two n simplices by their boundary to get Sn. So for example, S2 is like gluing together these two triangles by their boundary. And um, if you think about it, this should give that the nth homology group of Sn is isomorphic to Z because the only thing in the kernel is going to be the boundary of this first one minus the boundary of this second one. But finding the other homology groups wouldn't be as easy just using simple short homology. Okay, sorry about the lag there. Um, so there's some advantages to this that it's pretty easy to calculate for simple spaces, but disadvantages is like not always easy to put a delta complex structure on a space, and it's unclear if this homology has any desirable properties. Like if you pick a different delta complex on a space, does it change the homology groups? Is it even homeomorphism invariant? Is it homotopy invariant? So that leads us to define singular homology, which is more versatile and it's easier to show it has all the properties we want. But in the end, they're the same thing. So for problems, you can just use whatever method you find easier for that particular problem. It doesn't matter. The singular homology 
It has a really similar definition to simplicial homology in the sense that you first look at a collection of maps from n simplices into your space and then define the groups of n chains as free abelian groups over their images. Um, but this is a lot more general because now we're looking at all possible continuous maps. So it doesn't need to embed the n simplex into x. It could even be trivial just sending this to a point of x. And we look at all possible such maps. Um, again, the singular n simplex is actually the image of one of these maps, alpha, but we'll refer to it just as alpha. And we have, again, a group of n chains, but now it's overall singular n simplices. And we, again, have the boundary homomorphism. Um, it's defined exactly the same way as before, um, but now we're just looking at, I guess, the, the images won't exactly look like n simplices, but we're still looking at the images of these maps. Um, and then we could show that the composition of consecutive boundary homomorphisms is zero in the same way and get the n singular homology group for space x. And that is just going to be exactly the same definition. So it's the image of del n plus one, or sorry, the kernel of del n over the image of del n plus one. I have a quick okay. question. Um, yes. So is this x here, or is this just any topological space, or is it still a cyclical complex? No, this is any topological space. It doesn't matter if you could put a delta complex structure on it, because now you're just looking at continuous maps from n simplices into x. I see. So, it, yeah, it doesn't, it, this could, I mean, I can't, like if x was just a single point, all of these maps are just gonna be the trivial map, but that's, fine. Or if X was some crazy space, it doesn't matter. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. X is X is the space we're interested in studying. So like that's the yeah. space we're taking the homology up. Yeah, exactly. So if X was simple enough that you could just draw it as a delta complex, um, you could use the simplicial homology groups if that's easier. Um, but singular homology just has a lot of nice properties that I'll go over now. So for singular homology, it's a lot easier to see that if two spaces are homeomorphic, they have isomorphic homology groups. So if we say this is, if we say like F is the homeomorphism between X and Y, then we have a continuous inverse. So, <clears throat> then we can just send um, a singular n simplex alpha in the homology group for x to f of alpha in the homology group for y, because this is a continuous map from delta n into y, which is all we need. And then we can just send it back via F inverse. So we have this invertible function between them. Um, and then another easy result to see is that if X is the disjoint union of path connected components, then its homology group should just be the direct sum of the homology groups of those respective components. Um, and the reason for that is just if I have an N chain in X, we can always write it as a sum of n chains in each of the components. So let's say we have like an i alpha i. We could always write it as like a sum over this and a sum over, um, I guess, these guys in x alpha.
So we could, I mean, any chain is going to be contained or any basis element is going to be contained in one of these path connected components because it comes from a continuous map. And so we could always just write an n chain as a sum in each of these components. And then it's clear that since the homology groups come from these n chains, we will be able to write it as the direct sum over the path connected components. And then here's a couple of other <coughs> basic properties. So if a space is non-empty and path connected, then it's zero homology group is actually equal to Z. So um, what this is saying is that um, one way we can show this is we can take the map from the set uh, this group on zero chains into Z, given by, let's say we have a sum over some coefficient, the sum over some points, because remember the zero simplices are just points, then we're going to just send it to the sum of the coefficients in Z. So the, we want to show that the kernel of this map is actually the set of points that is the boundary of some one simplex. So what this says is like, let's say we have a bunch of a bunch of points, sigma i. So let's just write them as like v v i's, like v1, v2, v3, etc. And we're assigning some values to them, which are the n i's. So let's say we give this one a plus one, we give this one a minus one, we give this a plus one, a plus two, and a minus three, and like a, I don't know. It doesn't matter, but the sum of the values we assign to them equals zero. So that's what it means for a zero chain to be in the kernel. It's basically a collection of points. Now, because this space is path connected, we can pick any point we call it v naught in the space, and we can draw these paths to it from each of our points. And now each of these individual lines is a one, a singular one simplex. And so we could write there's an element in C one of x. We could write it as the sum over ni of v naught vi. So we're identifying this one simplexes by these lines, by their vertices, so v naught to vi. So we could say that this is an element in the C1 of x. And now what happens when we actually evaluate the boundary of that? Well, we're going to get um, basically the sum over the ni's of the i minus v naught. And when we work that out, that's just going to be the sum over the ni's of the vi's plus v naught times the sum over the ni's. But that's zero. So we're left with this, which is exactly this element. So we've shown that we can write anything in the kernel of phi as the boundary of some one chain in our space. So that shows that, uh, I mean, then you would also need to show that, well, then you would also need to show that anything that's a, the boundary of a one chain is in the kernel. But I guess I probably don't have time for that and I don't think it's super, complicated or super interesting. So then we would get the C naught of X mod del del one of C one is isomorphic to Z by this being a kernel. And that's exactly the homology group. And then four is just pretty much clear from three. So for a single point, the 
zero homology group is Z, because it's obviously path connected. And then the and for any thing above zero, the I homology group is just zero. That's just because there are no there's no like non-trivial maps from higher dimensions into your space. And then one thing to note is that the first homology group is the abelianization of the fundamental group. So that's just saying that it's pi one um, quotient by the commutator subgroup. So how you could see that is if I guess, so look at a cycle in C1, the group of one chains. A cycle is just a loop because we would have identified its two endpoints. Um, and then if we consider two homotopy equivalent loops that both start at X naught, so we'll call this A and call this one B, then the interior part of them is a sum singular two simplex with a boundary A minus B. So in, um, in the first homology group, we're basically identifying any two um, loops that are homotopic to each other because their difference is a boundary. Um, however, in the group of one chains, we don't have any relations between these equivalence classes. So if we took the element A plus B minus A minus B, which is like something in the commutator, that's a zero because everything is commutative. Um, so this is kind of an intuitive way of seeing why H1 is the abelianization of pi1 because it's it's all the same relations plus we're removing these um, relations A, B, A inverse, B inverse. So a nice example of this is if we look at the torus, um, the fundamental group is Z plus Z. It's generated by these two loops, one going around it this way, B, and one going around it at the top, A. And it's because this is abelian already, the first homology group of the torus is equal to the fundamental group. Um, versus if we look at the wedge product of two circles, the fundamental group is the free group, um, which does not have the um, commutativity relation between our two generators because there's no way to yeah, like interchange the order that we go around these two circles via a homotopy. But if we were to look at the first homology group of the wedge product, it's actually just the direct sum of these of z plus c because we don't care the order that you go around these loops. We just care about whether it's a boundary. And you can see that um, Z plus C is the abelianization of the free group. So that can be um, useful sometimes that the fundamental group will tell these spaces apart, but the homology groups don't. And then um, another super important property is that the singular homology is homotopy invariant. Um, this is a main result, but I'm not going to go over the proof of it. Um, it's kind of tedious and very long, so we don't really have time for it. But I am just going to go over some of the concepts that go into this. Um, so it, it's pretty much a, a way to... I'll, I'll go over this in terms of the language of functors. So let's say we have a function, a function f, it's a map of topological spaces from x to y. It induces a homomorphism from the homology groups of x to the homology groups of y in the following way. So if we start with this map from x to y, we can get a map on the chain complexes 
uh, the n chains of x to the n chains of y simply by pre-composing with f, and then we extend it linearly to make it a homomorphism. And then we can show that this f sharp is, is it actually creates a commutative diagram from the um, chain complex on X to the chain complex on Y with these induced maps um, connecting them. And then anytime you have a commutative diagram on chain complexes, it also induces a well-defined homomorphism between the homology groups. So all this FSR does is it sends a class of um, it sends a class of cycle in here to the class of F composed with that cycle in here. So it's not a complicated map. And then up here, I'm just writing these homology groups as the direct sum of all the, the homology groups. So these are like uh, containing all the information over all the different groups. And then just to say this super formally, we have a functor from topological spaces to graded abelian groups, where the graded abelian groups are just direct sums over some abelian groups. This functor takes a topological space X to the direct sum of its homology groups, and it takes a map between two spaces to this induced map between their homology groups as I explained on the last page. Um, and then because it's a covariant functor, I believe it's that it respects composition. So if we take the induced map of F of G, it's the induced map of F composed with the induced map of G, and it also respects identities. So even though I didn't show the proof that um, the homology is homotopy invariant, these properties could just be used to easily show that if a map between X and Y is a homotopy equivalence, then the induced map is an isomorphism. Um, and that's because we have some G so that F of G is the identity on X and then G of F is the identity on Y. And then when we take the induced map, we end up getting that this has to be the identity on the homology groups of X. And then we also get that G star of F star is the identity on the homology groups of Y. And then this shows that G star is F star inverse and F star is isomorphism. So the point here is just that we have a homotopy equivalence um, and we have a functor that, take, functor that takes maps on topological spaces to their induced maps on homologies. So are there any questions about that before I go to some of the other tools you can use to calculate homology groups? Okay. So some of the tools you can use are, we have various different long exact sequences between homology groups of spaces and those can be pretty useful, I'll do a couple of cool problems that involve them. So I'll just say this definition, um, but it's, it's not gonna be too important for the rest of the talk. So a good pair, which is, like, is actually what they're called, is a pair of topological spaces X and A, where A is a closed subset of X, and there's a deformation reach
Are there any questions so far while she probably reconnects? Yeah, CW pairs are good. Um, this is why like, I think all algebraic topologists use CW stuff, or at least if you ask Michael Andrews. Um, Yeah, would turning off our video help with the, uh, I don't know how, how the internet works. It should help like her connection, but I don't know if it will help like to get her connected again. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's writing. Or is this on delay? Do these sort of like foundational things ever come up in the fall? Like, like the prism proving, operator? Uh, yeah, like prism stuff. Like, no, like if they do, it's come up like once. So, yeah, so exactly like the proof she skipped over has to do with this prism operator and these chain maps. Um, it's probably not worth your time. Like, you know, if you're going into algebraic topology, if you take a course on algebraic topology, it will be covered, um, but it, it, it doesn't show up um, very often. Sometimes like a chain map will be mentioned, but, but yeah, the, the, the foundational proofs are usually not covered. As a brief, like larger structure question, I guess, how far in Hatcher do we make it? I guess. Up through chapter three, up through the cohomology chapter. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, yeah. Those point care. Oh, yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And that, that's all that's covered on the call. If you take like 227, um, mm -hmm. I think in A, you'll talk about uh, chapter four and you'll talk about like general homology theories. Mm -hmm. um, and then 227B is more like a topics class. Like uh, I think Mike Hill does some like obstruction theory or obstruction bundles. Uh, maybe some of you are in that. All right, cool. Does chapter three and Hadra cover like KGN type things? I think it's in the uh, appendix maybe. Uh, okay. Like he has, he has these like additional topics at the end of chapters, uh, which are actually really cool, but they are more specialized. Like even in the first few chapters, there's some cool stuff there. So is, is she going without audio or is it still on delay? Should we try to send her a message? Yeah, I tried to send a message on Discord, but um, I'm, I'm worried she, I don't think she can see or hear us or see the chat, so.
are, are we able to like forcibly kick her out of the meeting or restart the meeting? Maybe that would force her to like her computer to reconnect it. Yeah, but it's her meeting. Oh, she's the host. Yeah, so <laughs> I don't think we can. All right. Oh, she left. No, she's still here. I just raised my hand. Hmm. So we need to, to crash the to crash the meeting. We can try to fill in the audio to her slides. Um, <laughs> so there's a there's a nice long exact sequence for relative homology. Um, similar to Meyer via Torres, mm -hmm. where you'll see there's a short exact sequence on the chains, which we then use the snake lemma. Wait, what goes wrong for non-relative homology? Um, what do you mean non-relative homology? Like, like relative homology is when you like augment the sequence by like z and negative one. And so like, I guess like H0 versus H0 twiddle, do you still get? Oh, you mean reduced, reduced homology. Oh, you reduced, sorry, not relative. Yeah, yeah. Reduced. Uh, I, think, I think reduced is just, it's only affecting the zero homology. Um, and the, the idea is just to like, sort of take the a preferred base point out of the equation, right? Right, okay. So like, like she was saying earlier that like, we have this augmentation map, and the things in its kernel are sort of representing this, like if it's path connected, that we can remove that dimension. Um, so we shouldn't prefer a base point over anything else. Um, and also what's nice about reduced homology is that um, it makes a lot of theorems easier to write. Otherwise you'd have to write like, uh, the homologies are equal in all dimensions except for zero and then have a special case for zero. But when you do things in reduced homology, it ends up just, you know, like it takes care of that special case. So I guess like the empty simplex really is a simplex then. Ex yeah, exactly. Um. Oh, and I guess you can like go back and forth between them, right? Like reduced and non-reduced by like, I don't know. Adding a Z. Yeah, or like, was it like pairs of the same things as like quotients, if they're nice enough, like CW pairs or something? Yeah, exactly. If they're nice enough, we'll see that the, like the homology of the quotients are the, is the same as the relative homology. Um, whereas in general, this is not true. So like, if you don't have a good pair, so the example is like the Hawaiian earring, versus the uh, infinite wedge of circles. Ugh. Like if, if you remember that the, uh, for the Hawaiian earring, the fundamental group was actually not countably generated. Um, and this comes up, whereas the infinite wedge is. So it actually, you can see the difference in how you quotient versus taking like relative homology. Um, so this is like a typical example, but like, you know, if your space is nice enough, then that it ends up being um, pretty much the same. Uh, this is problematic. She's sort of progressing. Um, Does anyone have like her cell phone number or a way to contact her that's not via the internet? What if we all uh, left the meeting and then came back? We can try this. All right. Fair enough. All right, that works. I sense no change. I'm not really sure what to do. 
uh, maybe the best case is that on her end, there's audio and it's getting recorded. <laughs> but, but even then, this isn't this isn't great. Um, this is such a strange like error to have. Like I, I like I understand like her being kicked out of the meeting closing or something, but like her screen share continuing while like her audio and video doesn't is so weird. Right. Just, you know how computers work. Can you fix this? Uh, yeah, like I was saying, we got a DDoS Zoom and then the meeting will crash. Easy. Perfect. Easy peasy. Hmm. Yeah. I wonder if since her screen share is working. Oh, yeah. Okay, never mind. Just thinking of like tweaking with the other Zoom things that we can do and seeing what happens. It's sort of weird. I mean, she hasn't gotten any feedback from us in a while. So maybe she thinks we're being really bad. <laughs> That's pretty. That actually be hilarious. I can Im I, that's yeah, that must suck. I can imagine like being like any questions and there's just dead silence. And yeah. You can't hear anyone. So I guess we missed the definition of relative homology, but now she's she's using it to calculate some nice spaces. So this is like a big tool. Um so we're gonna use it to calculate SM. Um so essentially if you take the disk and and quotient out by its boundary, you get the sphere, right? Like imagine taking a disk and then identifying it to a point. Um, so we can use this and because we know the homology of like things like DN, we can get some like inductive homology results using the long exact sequence. Um, so this is what she's doing right now. So you have like the, the boundary includes into DN, which then you have a map to the quotient. Um, and since dn is contractible, then all of those things will be zero and you'll get a bunch of uh, equivalences between the nth homology of Sn and the n minus one homology of Sn minus one, which will be enough to tackle because we could do it for like S1 and then you get everything else for free or with S zero. Um, so this is what's going on right now. And an interesting result is actually like that the, if you have a space, I don't know if we've defined suspensions, um, but the a suspension is pretty much like you, on each end, you like cross it by an interval and then you contract it to a point. So it's like you cone off two ends. And so it turns out to be that the suspension of a space just boosts up the homology by one degree. So the suspension of a space is a one uh, is a manifold or a, a space of one dimension higher. And when you take its homology, you see that like the homology in one dimension higher is the same as the, the homology. Um, and it has a nice property that the suspension of a sphere is just the next sphere. So if you think about this, like first, like, you know, S zero is two points. If you take its suspension, you're sort of coning it off and you get like sort of like a diamond, which is S one. And if you take S1 and you take its suspension, you're coning off on two ends, which is like a sphere. Um, and so using this, we could also calculate that. So like using the result that the suspension is the same homology, you just shift up a degree. So I texted, I, I shot Eric a message and he has Luna's phone number. So we can call her if we want to. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's try that. Um, I guess I could call too, but I don't know if anyone wants to call. I, yeah, I can call. That's fine. Um, you're kind of the leader, so. Well, I don't know about that. 
Is she going to pick up a call from an unknown number during a meeting? I've never picked That's up a, a call point. from an unknown number. Uh, That's a really good point. <laughs> I, could t I could message Eric and ask if he will uh, call her. But I guess if I was presenting, I wouldn't pick up calls from Can friends either. Please, please. Nope. It looked all, it seemed like it went straight to voicemail too. Oh, is she a responsible presenter and she silenced her phone? Yeah, <laughs> true. Um, so, so like essentially that's what she calculated here. So like we see that the homology of SN is a Z in degree N and a Z in degree zero and everywhere else in between it's zero. Uh, which which agrees with the uh, simplicial homology. Like SN is really easy to build simplicially. Um, and then she's doing this to prove the Brouwer fixed point theorem. Um, that the boundary is not a retractive DN. So this suspension thing, is that because like, Like sigma x x is like your audio is cutting in and out. So yeah. yeah. Uh, is that contractible? Sigma x mod x. Uh, can you repeat that? I think I only. Yeah. Heard it. yeah. Is sigma x mod x contractible? I just wondering how there's some like sigma x mod x. Yeah. Basically, I'm wondering how the suspension thing works because. Yeah. I think you proved the suspension result using this like relative homology sequence in a clever way. Right. Um, sigma but I guess mod you x. You need to know like the homology of the quotient is trivial. Yeah, you can also think of it as some sort of excision, I think. Like if you remove the points at the top, like a deformation retracts onto x. Right, right. So you might be able to prove it with excision. I'm, I don't actually remember how you proved it. Um, but let's try to see what she's doing now with the uh, boundary of the disk is not a retract of the disk. Um, so she's saying if it were a retract, then we would have that their homology that are the same. So why is that? I mean, I see that if it was a deformation retract, but uh, like just a normal retract, is that still true? You definitely get a new. Well, okay, so you'll have a continuous map, right? So you'll have an induced map from, from the homology of DN into the homology of the boundary, and you have a map the other way from the inclusion, right? Um, and I think retract gives you that the compositions are the identity, which I then think if you apply the functor, you'll get that they're isomorphic. Does that track? Oh. Yeah, so like the inclusion is like injective on homology? Yeah, exactly. Right, okay. Um, so I think you can you can use these like functorial properties to get that they're the same, um, but then this is just wrong, right? Because the boundary is the sphere. Wait, sorry. Why would in, is inclusion always injective on homology? Um, no, it's it's a special property of retracts because you have a splitting of the inclusion, and so you get a splitting of the induced map on homology, which gets you injectivity on like abelian groups. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If R composed I is the identity, this tells you that the I must be injective, right? Right. Gotcha. To get the overall thing injective. Did we have this exact same conversation like week zero? I feel like we looked at this exact problem before. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like but, we, but we did it. One. But we did it for. Uh, no, I'm going to be very useful. This I, um, is being I think recorded. maybe, maybe go back to the. Uh, like, I don't think we have to go over these problems again. I think we talked through it and maybe people are on the same page. Okay. Uh, maybe just mention if there's anything you need to mention about the uh, relative homology sequence. Oh, this one in the example or just? No, be before the, the example. Uh, before. Um, Maybe if there are any questions oh. here. Yeah, so I think um, all, all I was saying, I mean, is that, well, I, I don't know if you heard here, just 
good to remember that the relative homology is not the quotient of the homology groups. Um, it's the homology induced from the quotient. Um, and then in this next page, does anybody have questions about this? I think the, the key thing is just here is probably just number three, that the relative homology is the reduced homology of the quotient. So for good, for good pairs, yeah. For Yeah, for good pairs. So for the whole rest of this talk, except I think the very last ball problem, you should just assume that everything is a good pair. Um, but this is, the reduced homology is the same everywhere except zero. So this is just pretty much saying that the homology of the quotient is the same as the relative homology, except at zero, the relative homology no longer cares about the um, first path connected component, I guess you could say, whereas the quotient homology, it still does. So that's why you um, write us the reduced quotient homology. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. So there's only, I think, maybe one more slide, and then it's going to be all qual problems pretty much from there. So hopefully it won't be a super long talk. Um, so the last theorem is the excision theorem. So we're taking uh, two subsets of X, so Z and A, where Z is a close is is fully contained inside A. So just I mean this is sort of a technicality, but just think of it as something like this: where we have X, we have A, and then we have Z that's completely inside of A. So the excision theorem says that we have an isomorphism between the relative homology group on X minus Z relative to A minus C and the relative homology group of X relative to A. Um, and this you can think of as in this relative homo homology group to A, we're already ignoring the end chains that are inside of A. So when we remove Z from A, it doesn't do anything because we're already ignoring everything inside A anyway. The proof of the excision theorem is actually pretty long and tedious as well, so I'm not going to go over it. Um, you can feel free to read about it if you want to. Um, and then there's another equivalent way you can state this theorem, which is if I have two sets who are, whose union covers X, so it's just um, we get open cover of X by A and B, then we have an isomorphism from the homology group of B relative to the intersection of A and B into the homology groups of X relative to A. And you can just get this equivalent formulation from the original theorem. If you set B to be X minus C, so now we're like, basically taking all of this as B. Um, and then the green part would be A. So then this sort of donut shape would be A union B, or A intersect B rather. So these two different formulations might be useful for different problems, depending on what sets, subsets of X you have information on. So here's a couple example problems using the excision theorem. This is really one problem. Um, so the first is show that the map induced by the inclusions from the direct sum of path
path uh, of these spaces X alpha into their wedge product is an isomorphism. So that's what that's just saying is that if we have a wedge product of a bunch of X alphas, so let's say this is X1, X2, X3, and they're joined by some point X. So this is like X1 wedge, X2 wedge, X, sorry, not this wedge, X2 wedge, X3. We're saying that the homology group of this space of this is just equal to the direct sum of the homology groups on each of the spaces. So it doesn't really matter that they're connected by a point. That's kind of what this is saying. So we'd like to use uh, okay. So for this problem, we would like to use the fact that the we'll, we're gonna use a couple of a couple of things to create a, a chain of isomorphisms. So first let's look at the relative homology group of the wedge product. We can write that as the disjoint union over the alphas of these spaces mod the set of points that we are wedging or sticking them together at. And I, I guess I should just note again that we're picking these points that we stick together the x alphas at so that these pairs are good. Um, but that answers gosh. your question. Thanks. Yeah, so it, it, I mean, that sh really shouldn't be an issue when you're looking at um, manifolds, right? Because I, I think like any point has a deformation retract in a little neighborhood of it. it would just take a little ball around it. So that, that I mean, that, it's not a very large condition. Um, okay. And then I, I think I, that I wrote this corollary, but the sound may have been off for this, but we can write the relative homology here just as This quotient. We can write it in terms of a relative homology of the quotient. And then this here is just going to be a single point. Yeah, so this was the result that um, the, the nth homology of a space relative to a single point is just the reduced homology of um, the quotient. So that was on the last page. So we can write this this way. Um, and then that is just going to be equal to this. Um, and that was, this was another result in Hatcher that I think I, I may have neglected to write down. Um, but if you want to look at it, it's in the section on excision. Let me just find it really quickly so I can write it for you here. Um, yeah. So this is from Hatcher Proposition 2.2. It's, it's sort of, this I is, think this should sort of follow from like the third isomorphism theorem, like if you quotient both spaces, right? Like, yeah, that, it's, it's not a it is something like that. 
y mod a is the same as x quotiented by y. Yeah, because um, you get, I mean, you get some sort of an exact, a short exact sequence and then a commutative diagram using that. And then you can show the isomorphism. And then um, from the, one of the very initial uh, basic properties that I showed first, this is just a disjoint union of app connected spaces. So we can now just write this as a direct sum. And then again, using the fact that the um, relative homology or the homology groups relative to a point are the reduced quotient homologies, we just get this. Or maybe no, that's a, that's not using no result, but it's using this last. There's a couple of results that are. But that's using this result that I did not show. So that was a bit of a mess. <laughs> um, but the point is that the homology groups of the wet product are really simple in terms of the spaces that are wedged together. So now you'd need to probably go through each of these different propositions to check each of those isomorphisms, but I don't think any of them are um, seem like super far leap. But now we can do this qual problem from spring 10, number six. It's calculate the homology groups of Rn with k points removed as a function of n and k. So does anybody um, want to say how to do that? Uh, we want to assume that the x alpha, yeah, we do want to assume that because we're assuming that the the points and their spaces are good pairs. So that, yes, that's true, Jacob. Um, okay, so this one, it's, I mean, you can just think of Rn with k points removed as retracting onto the wedge product of um, K circles. So for example, if we look at this with, I don't know, five points removed, then we can just expand these until the circles become bigger and then sort of contract everything in Rn around them. And so then we get the Rn minus K points is um, homeomorphic to just the wedge product of K copies of, um, of S n minus one. And so now using this above, we know that the homology groups of, we're really looking for the homology groups of this wedge product. So we have um, that the nth homology group of this space X is equal to the direct sum over K copies of the nth homology group of S n minus one. So that shows us that taking out um, and points doesn't change the enthomology group. It's so hard to find a cursor. So Hn of x is still going to be zero, but what it does change is the n minus one homology group. We are now going to get the direct sum over k copies of c because the n minus one group 
homology for the n minus one sphere is z. And then um, we're gonna have hk of this is still zero for k from one to n minus two. And then at zero, this space is still path connected because we're looking at um, for n greater than or equal to two. So we'll just still get it. This is z. So this is just a really clear way you can see why the homology groups would count the holes in a space because we're literally counting how many n minus uh, or, or how many is n dimensional holes there are via this homology group. Um, so that's probably one of the most simple. Does, does everyone problems. does everyone see why that uh, retraction works? Like why it retracts onto the wedge of k spheres? Are there any questions on that? I think it's pretty similar to a problem that Sam did a couple weeks ago with this type of retraction. Um, yeah, let, let me know if you do have any questions. Okay, and then here's another qual problem that was a um, pretty simple application of the excision theorem. It says, uh, prove that if two open sets, U in Rm and V in Rn are homeomorphic, then the dimensions have to be the same, N equals N. Um, so remember that the excision theorem can be used with two open sets that cover the space. So really, um, we want to say that if U is homeomorphic to V, then that should tell us that for all K, the K homology group of U relative to U minus some point in U, so really can be any point, is um, it's, it's, sorry, where does this that? Should have that this is um, homeomorphic to the homology group of V minus some point of V. Sorry, I keep losing my spot. There it is. <laughs> um, Okay, so we should have this if U and V are homeomorphic because I'm removing a point from each of them shouldn't change anything. So um, by excision theorem, we know that U and Rm minus X are two open sets whose union covers um, Rm. So now we can write that this is actually isomorphic to the k homology of the intersection of these two sets, which is um, or the, the, to this Well, now we, we can actually say that this is homeomorphic to Rm relative to Rm minus x using this um, because we have that this u minus x is the intersection of our two open sets. And then we can um, take U as like the first one. So if we look at the excision theorem, we're basically, we've started with two open sets that cover RM 
And then we're saying that the, the, the relative homology of the first one um, to the, the intersection of the two of them, it should be the same as the entire space relative to the second one. So this comes from the excision theorem. And then we have the same result. So for um, V and Y, so we should have that these two groups are also isomorphic. And now you can kind of start to see how we'll get a contradiction. Um, and that's because um, we can use this long exact sequence on the relative homology groups. So we have the, um, the smaller subset, so Rm minus x, going into the quotient. We're going into Rm, going into the relative homology. Okay, so now you could see that uh, this long exact sequence makes things really easy because RM is contractible. So all of these terms are just gonna go to zero and we get an isomorphism between the uh, relative homology group and the homology group of Rm minus x, uh, which we know is homeomorphic to the m minus one sphere. So this shows that our homology groups for the um, Rm relative to Rm minus a point are equal to zero for all k that's not um, m, because our homology groups for the sphere are zero for all k that's not, uh, for, yeah, for, unless this k minus one is equal to m minus one. And then we have the same results for the Rn, zero for all k that's not equal to n. And then from this, we get that n must have been equal to m. So this is just, in my opinion, surprising that you have to go such a roundabout way to show something that seems kind of clear. But the idea is you can use the excision theorem to write these, um, to, write these relative homologies in terms of spaces that are really simple to Rm and the Rn. And then when you say exact sequence, a lot of terms go to zero because Rn is contractible and we know what the homology groups of the sphere are. So then we can arrive at this contradiction. Um, one thing that I thought was pretty interesting, but it, it's maybe not super useful for the call, is that you can use the excision theorem to show that around any point, the relative homology of the space to the space minus that point should be the same as the relative homology to um, any open neighborhood of that point relative that neighborhood minus a point. So for this homology relative to removing one point, you can just look at it locally. And then if you think about what the above problem tells you, this kind of says that um, two spaces cannot be locally homeomorphic if these local homology groups are not the same. So you could 
um, use this to determine when you can have a local homeomorphism between X and Y. This is again, not, I think, super useful, but I just thought it was a cool result. Okay, does anybody have questions before I just move on to the rest of the qual problems? Okay, so there's five more. Um, I would just remind you that you can use the simplicial homology or the singular homology in these problems. They're the same, so use whatever it seems easier. And then we can also use the mayer vittori sequence for homology groups. So there's a couple examples of this. The only difference between um, mayer vittoris for uh, last quarter and this quarter, or sorry, for this topic, is just the direction of the long exact sequence. So for cohomology, the arrow direction is reversed, but here the direction stays the same. So it's it's just slightly different. Okay. So this problem uh, says we have a space X that's the product of the circle with the disk. And we wanna confute the relative homology groups of that space um, relative its boundary. So this is a direct application of the exact sequence that we just used in the last problem. Um, so first let's compute the homology groups for X. Um, so we know that X contracts to just S1 because the disk contracts to a point. So we can really easily write out the homology groups for X. So we know that H0 of X is C, H1 of X is also C, and HI of X is just zero otherwise. Now we can look at the boundary of X uh, S1 times S1 is the same as the torus, and we know the homology groups of the torus. So we have H0 of X is C. H1 of X is Z plus Z. And then but the H2 of X is zero. Z, yeah, right. Sorry, sorry, H2 of X is but it's okay. Just want to find my notes for these problems, which I'm not sure where I have them. So now we can use the long exact sequence. Once we have these, it should make it pretty simple. So h i of x is just zero. So now we have um, starting with h3. Of the relative going to H2 of the boundary. So the first thing that we can find really easily is that H3 should be um, should be equal to Z. And 
because we know that this is just zero. So that's the first thing that we'll get. And now we have this remainder of the sequence. We have, sorry. And then each one of the boundary is this direct sum going into H1 of X, which is just Z, going into H1 of the relative, H0 of the boundary, H0 of Z. So this doesn't really tell us anything. So we actually need to look at the specific maps here. Um, and so let's look at this inclusion map here. This is the inclusion of the tor the inclusion from um, the torus into the circle. So if we have some map on the torus, so corresponding to two circ two kind of loops. Um, and say that's in each one of the boundary, then under the inclusion, it's actually just going to send it to the, the class of this single cycle A, because um, B is a boundary in, um, in H1 of X, because your X is just the circle. So this the second component just contracts to zero. And so we're just sending pairs A, B to the class of A. So from this, it's pretty easy to see that this map is surjected. And that. Uh, and another way of thinking about this is like, if you draw your two generators on the torus, and yeah. Notice X is like the filled in torus, like a donut, right? So like the, the uh, short one, the short one just contracts, right? Yeah, it does. Whereas the long yeah. one ends up surviving. Um, so you can think of it as like A being the first S1 and B being the second. And the second one is like getting included into a D2, which is then contractible. Okay. Yeah, that's probably a nicer way to think of it. Um, and then, so what this tells us is that, um, so given that this map is surjective, that means that the image of this is Z, which means that this is also Z. So now we just have one um, remaining homology group to find which is this one, oh, I guess we also have this. Um, and then we know that this is also the inclusion map, but since these two are just the same, I mean, the zero um, chains on the torus are the same as the zero chains in S1, they're, they're both path connected. So this is injective. Um, and then that shows that this map from here to here is just going to be the zero map, um, which shows you that this map is surjective and then this image is going to be Z. And then this is Z. And then the... Um, the zero homology group of this relative to its boundary um, is just the reduced, I think this is the last thing to find. So this relative to its boundary is just the reduced homology of X mod the boundary, which is zero. So this is just 
This is yeah. just zero. So th this is just, oh, yeah. I, I might be confused here, but so we have the, the map from like Z plus Z to Z, that's surjective. Yeah. So that next map should be the zero map, right? Well, if, if this is exact. This is, yeah. Uh, sorry, I had this labeled the wrong way. So this is the zero map. So then this one is injective. Okay, that's better. Yeah, but um, like because this, yeah. So this this works out to be z here, and then this one is just zero. So uh, it's not, wait, why, why is h one of uh, x relative its boundary z? H one of x. Oh no, it would need to be zero. Yeah, isn't it? I think so. Because this is now an isomorphism. Okay, so basically everything is zero except two and three, or both z. Um, let's do okay, this problem. So for this problem, we are looking at a space and then the reduced suspension of X is obtained from X by contracting um, this space, or I guess the boundary of the cylinder and the specific line through it to a point. Um, so I'll just, I think it's nice to just draw a picture of these. So if we have X, that's this then we can draw the cylinder. This is X times the interval. And these reduced suspension is just identifying the um, top and bottom of the cylinder and a line in between. So this is the, um, this is the reduced suspension of X. Um, whereas the suspension of X just identifies the top and the bottom of the cylinder. So this ends up looking like a cone. And this is called the suspension of X. So the reduced suspension identifies in addition to the top and bottom pieces. Um, it also identifies this line through the middle. And then the suspension of X, which we'll need in the solution is just, it turns this into a cone. It just identifies the top and the, and the bottom of this to a point. Um, now we need to describe the relation between the homology groups of X and the reduced suspension of X. So the way that we'll do that is um, by using the mirror Vitoris on the suspension of X and a, a trick. So we should note that um, X times the interval quotient by this line, it just retracts to X. So that space is going to have the same homology groups as X. So now let's just define Y to be this. So where we're just taking the cylinder and then we're identifying this line through the middle. So 
we're not identifying the endpoints yet. It's just this, this equivalent line. And now the suspension of Y, we now identify the top and the bottom together. So the suspension of Y is just the reduced suspension of X. So the main idea for this problem is that we're just going to write the HKs of the suspension of Y in terms of the HJs of Y. And then um, because X and Y, uh, because X is a retroactive Y, these things are just going to be the same. So what we need to do is cons uh, use Meravitoris to write this groups of the suspension in terms of the groups of Y. So these ones are kind of maybe tedious. Does anybody want to suggest a way to do this? Okay, maybe it's pretty clear to some people. Um, Maybe, but, maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe give them give them a few moments to think, and then okay, sure. sure. They'll come up with suggestions. Okay. I think you can do like uh, each open set being like half of the cone plus an epsilon, like in either direction. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly right. So we can just, I'll just draw pictures to make this a little easier to write and also to see. So we're just gonna set U to be the top half of this cone, but plus a little bit at the bottom. And then we're going to set V to be the bottom half plus a little bit at the top. So then U intersect V is just this little slice, essentially, um, which deformation retracts to Y. Um, so now we have maybe now we're gonna be able to write this meritorious sequence in terms of u and v um, and uh, the the other thing that is going to make this really simple is that u because it's a cone where we because it's a cone here, everything is path connected. And so you actually just contracts to the tip of the cone. And then uh, likewise for V, it also contracts to a point. So that's gonna make the um, exact sequence really simple. Um, because if for that's gonna give us that for all k um, greater than one, we're just gonna get an isomorphism between um, H k of the suspension and then um, H k minus one of y because these terms on either side are both the direct sums of homology groups of u and v which are just trivial okay so then the only thing to really look at is um like what happens at the end of the sequence so at the end of the sequence um we're gonna get this 
page one of the suspension going into H not Y going into H not U H not U. And now um, remember that these zero homology groups are really easy to calculate. The suspension is connected. So this is just C. Then U and V are both connected. So this is just Z plus C. Um, and then, so now we can see that the image here, because this is the surjection the image is C, and the kernel is Z here. So that means that the image of this map is Z. Um, and because these are group homomorphisms, we now have this um, short exact sequence. Um, and so if you're familiar with this, um, whenever you have something here that's uh, projective, the sequence splits, but um, since we're just working over basically groups that are isomorphic to direct sums of Z, if you ever have something like this in homology groups, I'm pretty sure this is always going to be like some Z to the N, which is free over Z. So this um, sequence splits. So what we'll get is that the middle term is isomorphic to the direct sum of the first and the last term. So in every case, but the um, in in like every case, but the last case, uh, we're we're getting that this suspension, the homology of the suspension is the uh, K minus one homology of the group itself. But then um, at one, we get something slightly different. And then at zero, we get Z. So now given that, um, y deformation retracts to x. So we basically have, this is the reduced suspension of x and y deformation retracts to x. So now we, we just have the answer, like we can write that hk of the reduced suspension of x is equal to hk minus one of x for all k greater than one. And then, um, and then we can write H one of this, this, I guess, this, and then um, the H naught of this is just C because it's connected. So that would be our answer. Did that make sense to everybody? And maybe another thing to comment is, uh, if we if we go to reduced homology groups, then the statement's a lot easier to write. Like you get that uh, for for H one as well with the reduced homology group of Y. Um, yeah. So a lot of times, like people will just write stuff in terms of reduced homology groups, just because it makes the statements a little nicer, so you don't have to go into these okay. separate cases. Yeah. That does that does make it sound nicer. Definitely. Um, so this is a nice problem. Like this is that problem was about as involved as it gets, I think. Um, oh, okay. The problem, we're we're like it's not it's not you know terribly difficult, but you do have to think about like what's going on and you decompose it the right way and so on. Yeah, I think um, to me the trickiest part is kind of thinking that you're going to write things in terms of the suspension, because I found this construction a little confusing. But once you know the plan, then working out the details of the sequence is not 
too bad, I think. Okay. So this is spring 2018, problem seven. Uh, let M and N be smooth, connected, orientable N manifolds, and then M um, pound N is their connect sum. So we don't really, for this, we're only doing part B, so we don't really care about N greater than or equal to three, I think. Um, and then just to define the connect sum is we remove an open ball from M and some open ball from N. And then we glue M to N by the boundary of this ball. So for example, in two dimensions, if you had two toruses, um, so T1 and T2, then T1 connects on T2. It's just going to be we remove a disk from T1, and we remove a disk from T2, and then we join them together. So we'll just get a torus, two, torus with two holes. Um, it's definitely harder to visualize than higher dimensions, but that's the idea. And it's, um, who's still, well, I can go over the rest since there's still a couple of people here. Um, there's only two more, so hopefully it shouldn't take too long, but just let me know if you do need to head out. Um, and then here, since everything is connected, it doesn't matter where you remove the ball and where you glue them, because you could always move that around. So um, does anybody have an idea for how you might do this problem? I guess Olga or Joss, since you're the only people still here. My first guess would be like the same idea of a cover where you just kind of like take M and then like push it a little bit in the direction of N, do the same thing for N. It's a little weird because then the inter, then like those open sets like deformation attract onto M minus a point and N minus a point instead of just M and N themselves. So somehow we have to understand the homology of M and N minus a point, but maybe that's doable. Yeah. Um, oh, and I guess the intersection is just this, a sphere, right? Yeah. Which we know. Yeah. So this is exactly um, right, but I also found it kind of strange to think about this. Um, but let's just, yeah, so just to draw it, you're saying it's going to look something like this is U, right? It's like M plus a little bit, and then this is V. Is it N plus a little bit? Um, okay. So they give you a couple of things. Just initially, we know that the entomology is going to be Z from what they say in the problem. And we know that the zero one is also going to be Z because everything is connected. So this is basically just given to us. Is the connected sum always oriented or always orientable? Mm -hmm. I looked this up and I think it yeah. is. On, when you're gluing on the boundaries, you glue with opposite orientations. And this will induce an orientation on the whole thing. Um, yeah, because you only need it to work at the boundary. So I guess. If you remove the ball from three dimensional space, you kind of be gluing it inverted on the inside. Um, but yes, it, it's it is always orientable. So these are just given to us from that. Um, and then here, I want to just note that you intersect V. It's going to be SN minus one. And we know the homology groups of that. 
So it's going to be um, pretty, pretty simple. And then also uh, these retract into like, so m minus a point is actually n minus one dimensional, right? So that gives you that um, just these n homology groups of u and v should both be zero. So now we could write out the beginning of this sequence. So we have we start with zero, going into the connect sum. So is there an and easy way to see that m minus a point is n minus one dimensional? Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't know, maybe Joss or Olha, do you have an idea? Is this obvious? Or like, uh, is I guess, uh, not that it is n minus one dimensional, but it's like it retracts onto something that's n minus one dimensional. That what? Like this n minus a point, right? Saying that it's n minus one dimensional or equivalent to something n minus one dimensional. It's definitely intuitive. How come? Oh no, obviously. <laughs> I mean, I believe it's um, wrong. I, I don't know. Like it's it's is it that believable? I think it's um believable, but it's it it depends, right? If you were to remove a point from the edge, like if M did have boundary and you removed a point from the boundary, then this wouldn't be true. So Right. I mean, you, you definitely need that the connect sum is removing an open ball from M. In order so for you need the thing, thing to be connected, probably. Yeah, definitely connected. Because otherwise, if you remove it from a different component, it won't change. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know yeah. why, like, topologically, like, you can t remove an interior point and deformation refract onto something smaller dimensional. Like I believe it for like the torus or for the R2 or something. But I think just in terms of like homology, you can use like the long exact sequence of relative homology and the fact that manifolds are locally just like balls. And if you take away a point from a ball, oh, maybe that's why I use n gradient equal to three. You take away a point from a ball of dimension at least three, it is um it has the wait, its homology will be like the same. No, it'll be the homology of like a sphere. Uh yeah, it'll be one dimensional lower. Yeah, maybe yeah, maybe, maybe you this like local local homology that Luna was talking about. Yeah, and then the long X sequence um, there with local homology should let you like kill the top homology of the manifold minus an interior point. Right. That, yeah, that checks out. Um, one way to think about this in the, in the very specific case of a uh, cell complex is you can think about, let's say you only have one top cell, right? One n-dimensional cell in your, in your uh, space M. Then if you remove an interior point from that, you can retract it onto the boundary. Right, like onto the attaching map boundary. So essentially, if you only had one top cell and taking an interior point from that would make you have like zero top cells. So you'd be right. a dimension lower. Is it true that manifolds can always be given only one top cell? Um, this is probably true for a connected orientable manifold without boundary. Um, oh, you can probably similar. you could probably do this. So uh, Morse theory gives you this nice back and forth between homology and uh, and like a handle decomposition, which is very similar to like a CW decomposition. Mm -hmm. So you can I think you can show that you can always do it with one top dimensional handle body, which is like a top dimensional uh, cell. Oh gotcha. Okay. Okay, right, sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry for the distraction. It's just like it's not no, no. It's like intuitively it might be true, 
but at the same time, it's hard to pinpoint. Yeah. Um, that's true. So for this one, it's it's basically um, working out the details of this meritorious sequence is um, maybe not super exciting. Like, I, I don't know if it might be worded to, for me to just sort of summarize it and then go to the next two problems that are something a little bit different. Or if you want to see it worked out, that's fine too. That's, I, I think this is probably one. fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I, I think it, the idea is just that since you're removing an end cell, it doesn't affect any of the relationships in the lower dimensions. And then when you think about the um, n minus one case, you removed an end cell that already, um, or you, you have a boundary and that's a new boundary, I suppose. Um, but it already was a boundary of the thing you removed. So in some sense, it doesn't really change much. Um, okay, so this one is a little different. Um, this is relating covering spaces to uh, so the, can I ask about what the what the answer yeah. was? Like what is the homology of the connected sum in oh. general? So in the in the end, I, I I believe it's it's just the direct sum of the homologies of these two spaces. Pretty much in all the lower there. dimensions. Um so like except for n and zero, it's gonna be the direct sum. Like if you look past the yeah, n, so it's gonna be z at n and zero. But and then, then the yeah, homology it's... of the spheres, right, are zeros on both sides. So you get a bunch of mm. um, isomorphisms, right. and then you just have to look at the n minus one part and the zero part, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and then because of what you're discussing, these homology groups. Um, for all the lower dimensions should just match M and N. So you'll get that this is um, isomorphic to the direct sum for all basically K between zero and N and then this is C. Oh, I already wrote it up here. I need to go now too. Thanks so okay. much, Luna. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. Sorry, it was a bit um, off. Um, yeah, so maybe I don't know if Joss has to go. Um, yeah, this uh, one should be basically ones. about your topic. So it's pretty, it should be like pretty fast for you. Cool. Let's, let's do this then. And then this one, I, I never figured it out. So feel free to think about this and let me know what you think about that one. This oh, is this very is gross. strange. Yeah. Uh, so for it's, 10? It's like a stupid space, as you would say. So, um, but this one, number 10, for A, um, is just the fact that um, this one is simply connected. So the fundamental group of this is just zero. So if we have a map, um, so we, we basically can say that a lift exists if the image, well, let's just read this. Um, so this one exists 
it can only if the image of um, this is contained in the image of this. But since this is a universal cover, this is simply connected. And so these are both just trivial. These, this group and this group. So we can say that the lift exists. I guess you're familiar with these results already. And then for part B, um, you can get this result just because since the universal cover is simply connected, you can um, basically find some element of the fundamental group of X so that its lift is a path between any two uh, points in the fiber, right? And then since these lifts of the map sigma are uniquely determined by a point, we can always um, act on one to get to the other because we can always move from a point to another point in the fiber of the base. This. Oh, okay. I see. So, like, you, you like right pick some like, like, like X not twiddle in the universal cover or something, and then there exists some deck transformation taking like, like sigma one of that to sigma two of that. And then because of like the transitivity of the deck trans group and the fact that they're determined by one point that like in, that entire deck transformation does that. Like for yeah, because if we pick base points, um, then each like sigma i is uniquely determined by its, I guess it's base point. We can just call it this in here, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's, yeah, it's exactly like you said, so like simply connected means that G acts transitively on the fibers. And so we must have had that there is some X in X such that this set of X I alphas are contained in the green image of this X. And so um, we can just act on this fiber transitively to get from um, AI to AJ. Right. So, I guess this only, so like the first part only used that it was simply connected delta n and the second part i think works completely generally as long as you have two lifts right it doesn't use any topological factor about delta n as far as i can tell it doesn't use anything yeah right i think the first part right requires that the uh like the delta n is simply connected and doesn't use the universal cover the second part uses the universal cover and the existence of a lift, right? But it doesn't matter right. what the lift is or what delta n is. Uh, right, right. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't even need to be a universal cover in A. It just needs to yeah. be a cover. Right? right, yeah. So this is a nice thing in, in A, you pretty much show the result that if you're like, uh, like your domain is simply connected, there always exists a lift. Yeah. Yeah, and this is just from the lifting criterion. Okay. And then uh, this one, yeah, this one, <laughs> I really couldn't figure it out because, I mean, here, this, I think the quotient space, I think it is the Hawaiian earring. It's like a bunch of loops going on forever. Um, this is X mod A. But then here, I don't even know if X and A is a good pair or not. So I don't even know if we can use any of the results from the rest. I think it won't be because like you take a neighborhood of zero and you contain infinitely many of the one over N. And so that neighborhood of zero can't like 
retract onto the like that that like that messed up thing over there. Right. And if it if it were a good pair, then the homologies would be equal. So this problem would be yeah. right. Um, well, actually, I don't even know what the what is the homology of the Hawaiian earring, though. I thought you said it might be uncountable. I think it's, it's yeah, maybe. But like either way, the prompt says to show that it's not isomorphic. But we know that for a good pair, those things are isomorphic, right? Um, like HN, the relative homology and the quotient homology, or at least in the reduced case. Yeah. You're right. So we know it can't be a good pair. Yeah, but the, the reason it's not a good pair is exactly what Joss was saying and exactly why like X mod A is this Hawaiian earring, right? Because any neighborhood of zero will contain infinitely many of these circles. Oh, that's so gross. Yeah. Right, which is, yeah, that's why it's like not locally contractible, right? Because at zero, you'll always contain a circle which is not contractible. And in fact, infinitely many. So do we know H1 of XA, by the way? Like H1 of X, we know is zero, obviously. I think H1 of A is also zero because like, like it's totally, is it totally disconnected? Yeah, H H1 of A is, oh. yeah, it's just a bunch of points, right? Yeah, I mean, they accumulate to zero, but it's still totally disconnected. I yeah, think, it shouldn't, right? Really. Yeah. So every map from the one simplex into A should be zero or like constant. Uh, I guess there were mm -hmm. a lot of those, but. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, H one of A should be zero. H one of X is zero. So, no, I mean, I guess we could. Yeah, but we can't use the long exact sequence, right? Ah, oh, damn. Yeah, you're right. Because they're not a good pair. Yeah, exactly. So it's. So this is when we have to. Uh, really, yeah, this is when we have to think about what relative homology is really saying, right? So you have to like know what the one simplices of X, like you need to look at the chain level for this, I guess. Oh, that's yeah. horrible. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this yes. is one we were, we were hoping you'd help us out with. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we're thinking that H, like X mod A should be this Hawaiian earring and X rel A should be something else. Well, C1 F doesn't have anything, uh, it, I mean, it doesn't have any one chain at zero, does it? Because you couldn't. Yeah, like the the one the relative one chains would be like the one chains that are, I guess, does it work? They're like the ones that aren't contained in A, right? Yeah. So isn't that like all of the basically almost all of them that aren't constant? <laughs> right. Um, yeah, pretty much all of them. Yeah, the only ones that aren't that are contained in A that you're getting rid of are the ones that are constant at the values in A. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hmm. it's kind of weird, right? Because you can take like you can take a chain from like you know that crosses one of these points that you're removing, right? Like you can go from like yeah. uh, I don't know one. Or, or I don't know, two fifths to four fifths or something. I'm sure that crosses some stuff. And then it's equivalence rel A, right? Is like going from like two fifths to the next one and then between them and so on. Um, so yeah, something, something's, oh, something something weird. weird goes on here. Right, so like for every, I guess, path that doesn't touch zero, like, it's you can decompose it into a finite sum of ones whose boundaries are on A. And therefore those boundaries of those ones will be zero in the relative sense, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess that means that the, like if we're trying to just figure out what the kernel is, those are a lot of things in the kernel. And uh, what else would be in the kernel? I guess any path from zero to one over N would also be in the kernel. Right. What about the image of the two simplices? What are those in this? 
Uh, those those are all like the two symbols of X. Yeah, they shouldn't give you anything too interesting, right? Because they're not going to be injective maps. Yeah. Yeah, something. Yeah, weird. won't it just be the same thing as the one? Simplices like you would have to go to an interval or a point, right? Yeah, so I guess this is just it's just all the intervals and all the points that aren't one of the one over ends, right? Yeah, I think, yeah, things in the kernels are right connecting any two points in the intervals, which is really just all the intervals on their own right okay. from one over n to one over n plus one this will give you like a basis of them so well the yeah the, the, kernel? the kernel is the intervals from the one over n's but I, I think you just just said this but anything that doesn't i mean if this is one over n plus one and this is one over n and this interval is not in the kernel right uh because we didn't identify these two bit, these two endpoints. No, because their boundary is in the chains in A, right? Those things should be in the kernel. Yeah, because the boundary is like uh, like formal one Are you over n about formal the one over kernel n. Kernel of this or yeah, a, yes. or zero. I guess we're look, Yeah, we're yeah we're looking at like uh, uh, cycles. Right. No, not cycles. What am I? Yeah, but isn't this not a cycle? Yeah, like because we, I mean, we've identified these these points, like one over n is equal to one over n plus one. But now we're looking at this interval. I think they are because, like, because like the boundary will be in C zero of a, right? Because mm -hmm. it's a um, the boundary is just a difference of yeah. points in a, and so. Yeah, like, because your quotient means like it maps to C0x mod C0a, right? So it'll be in yeah. the C0a part of it. So it'll map to zero under this. Yeah. So if the endpoints of the interval are in A, then it's going to map to. Oh, but you know, this one is an interval that's endpoints are not in A. Oh, yeah, sure. But, okay, but. So this, so these are the. Aren't these going to be the things that oh. are not in the kernel? Yeah, those okay, are. Yeah, I think I misheard this. Yeah, this is really messed up because we're still trying to compute the kernel of like these really infinite rank groups, mm -hmm. and like we found a bunch of examples. But a priori, why couldn't there be some like horrible, weird, like? Because uh, I guess somehow we want to say that the kernel is has basis precisely these things, but some weird other linear combination could a priori go to zero. So we would need some kind of like. Hmm. No, I don't think any. I mean, anytime you have any endpoint that's not one of these. Yeah, then it won't be in the kernel. It doesn't go to zero. Yeah, so, so that's like. Only... But you, you can't always compute the kernel just by looking at the basis elements, right? Because you could have some sums that go to zero that like are not obvious, I guess. No, I think that if their if their sum goes to zero, I'm pretty sure you can rewrite that as a sum of intervals or something like a, a homotopic to a sum of intervals that we did consider in our basis. Oh, so maybe like on the overlaps, you can like refine it and then like, then they sort of like match up to the other ones. And then those ones kind of like, I don't know if what I'm saying is reasonable. Yeah, yeah. Like the thing is like, Everything is normal here as long as you're staying away from zero. Like, like you, like if we took away this zero thing and we stopped, like, let's say at one over like a thousand, everything here would be normal. Like, you could have that basis of like a thousand small intervals for the kernel. The problem is that the zero, as you're going close to zero, I think funky stuff happens. Yeah. Like, like if we, let's say we're taking like, you know, in, if we remove that zero point, 
then these are isomorphic. Like that becomes a good pair, I believe. Right, okay. So something in our argument has to be close to zero. Like we have to look at things over there. And is this really a qual problem? This was a qual problem. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> uh, it may have been a qual problem when I took it. Oh, well, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, but you don't have to get all the problems on the qual. Uh, yeah, but I'd be so afraid of this one. I don't know. Yeah, you just you just uh, write. Okay, so so if you see this one on the qual, what you do is the game plan is to get partial credit and not think about this problem. So what you do quickly is you recognize that this guy is some sort of Hawaiian earring, and you tell them that. Like you show why like x quotient by a can be thought of as like a shrinking you know wedge of circles. And then you mention like random results, like, you know, how like the fundamental group is uncountable, like things like this. Um, and then you, you know, you mentioned that X rel A is not a good pair. Um, and you just, you just sort of try to hit some talking points at <laughs> some point and you never try to answer the problem and then you move on. Like, that sounds good. Yeah. You no, know, like you, you have like three or probably like two or three problems on the call to play with like this, where like you don't have to get them right but you don't want to say anything wrong. And then you can get some points. Um, and that's that's probably a good skill too. Just recognize the problems that, you know, you're not going to want to do and, and don't, don't get freaked out by them. And just focus on the ones you can do. Um, so I don't know what the answer to this is. Um, maybe, yeah, I'm sure someone does. There was also a problem on, on one of these calls, maybe 2020 or 2019, where like they wrote this call problem. This 